morning to the book of Luke, chapter 13, verse 6. And I'm going to read a portion of scripture here this morning, and then I'm going to go ahead and get into the second part of the series that I started last week. And some of you didn't know, but I took off to Europe, hallelujah, and just got back yesterday, praise the Lord. But it's been a busy, busy first few months of the year, and, uh, and it's good to be home. It's good to be back in Cape Town, South Africa. Amen? So Luke chapter 13, verse 6, the Bible reads like this. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. Someone say, ouch. ouch. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Somebody say, ain't not. Amen. Cut it down. Somebody, amen, amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Why should it use up the soil? And then thank God for his grace. Verse 8 says, Sir, the man replied, Leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it, and I'll fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If it bears fruit in 2020, fine. But if not, my God, help us, Jesus. Cut it down. Father, I pray your grace upon our life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Praise the Lord. Well, before I get into the message, you're going to be seeing the, uh, uh, it's been good to travel a little bit this year. Again, like I mentioned, I went to Mexico for the meetings that we have every year. We're Big Trail Outreach International. The family comes together, and we had a tremendous, tremendous time with our pastors. And the vision and the direction is clear of what God wants to continue to do within the ministry of Victory Outreach. They say that many organizations after 50 years begin to die or begin to plateau. Many ministries or organizations after 50 years begin to die or to plateau. And you know why they say that? Because many ministries or organizations never create opportunity for the future generations. For the future yeah. generations. Yeah. In other words, you're not uh, smart enough, or you're not good enough, or you're, you, didn't have, you don't have enough doctrines, <laughs> or you don't have enough diplomas, or you don't have this, or you don't have that. So you have to wait. You're not as gray as I am, so you need to wait first. You need to pay your dues before you can get involved in the ministry. And so while they're waiting for this next generation to pay their dues, they start dying. And they never passed the mantle or they never turned over the ministry. But how many thank God in Victor Outreach that we have leadership that gives opportunity, come on somebody, that gives opportunity to the future generations. And so therefore in 1993, Pastor Sonny began to create opportunity for a generation that was growing up in the church the God's anointed now generation, which is the Joshua generation. Yeah. Many of us are come from that and got saved during that time and we came to the Lord. And now many of the pulpits of the 30 countries, 36 countries that Victory Outreach is in with over six, 700 ministries, many of them are being led by that Joshua generation. That second generation that grew up in Victory Outreach International. I think that's a good place to clap. So a lot of us are about 45, come on somebody, some of us are 50, hallelujah, pretending like we're 45, come on somebody, don't play. still, I'm getting old too, I'm going bald, my God, we're getting older, but then our pastor again is still with us, and he says, you know what, the vision that God has given to the ministry of victory outreach is not for just one generation, it's a vision until Jesus comes back. There will be drug addicts and gang members and families that are being destroyed by the work of Satan. So we need to put things in place to make sure that the vision that God has given to us does not die with one generation. And so just recently, Pastor Sonny began to put a whole new generation into place. And now we have three generations that are operating in the ministry of Victory Outreach International. We have the, 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 the wisdom of the pioneer generation that sacrificed in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. Then we got the strength of the Joshua generation that began to take their place in the 90s. And now we have the third wave generation that is beginning to take their place in Victory Outreach International. Give Jesus a good round of applause. 
And so it's exciting to say that after all this travel, going to Mexico, to Europe, to, you know, to all these, California, I was there in San Diego, the Mother Church, I was in the Northern California, I was, I was everywhere, hallelujah. I woke up this morning, I didn't know where I was. I looked at them, I said, what hotel am I in, or where, where am I at, hallelujah. Am I the Bastion? Come on, somebody, in Amsterdam? Am I in, where am I at? And I see Gabriel's little foot right in my face, hallelujah. And I said, oh, I'm right back here in Cape Town, South Africa. Come on, somebody. That little foot, I can recognize it anywhere, hallelujah. Not just the look, but the smell. Come on, somebody. The smell of that little foot, hallelujah. Let me know that I was right here. And I've come here this morning to let you know that Victory Outreach is alive and well. 53 years, we're still going forward. 53 years, we're not on a decline. 53 years, we're not on a plateau. 53 years, drug addicts are still being saved. 53 years, gang members are still being saved. 53 years later, families are being put back together. Not just in California, not just in America, but in every country all over the world. Victory Outreach is alive! Go ahead and give Jesus a good round of applause if you're grateful to be a part of a ministry that is still going forward for the Lord. Hallelujah. And so I bring a good report back to us here this morning. And you know, a powerful thing is that many of us are, are seeing signs of revival. You go to San Diego, I think uh, Pastor Sam's mom just came in from San Diego, and they have an open window. Of, you can feel just a whole dimension of God's presence that's taking place in San Diego in ways that it hasn't in a long time, or maybe even never before, I'm not sure. There's a fresh window of revival. Then you go to the mother church, our mother church that gave birth to the movement. And they're having prayer summits and thousands of people that are coming into that sanctuary. I'm talking, I'm not talking about small groups. I'm talking about thousands of people that are coming into these places. And they're there just bathing themselves in prayer. Signs of revival. Then I came from Europe. Yesterday we were in Europe and I was there. and Man, signs of revival. But you know in all these places, you know what songs they sing? They sing South African songs. Why? Because from the most southern tip of Africa. Oh, you don't hear me this morning. From the most southern tip of Africa, there will be a revival that takes place all over the world. See, it's not just the songs that we sing, but it's the spirit that we possess. How do we know that we're in revival right here in South Africa? If you believe it, I need you to clap a little bit. Big count for Jesus is going to be packed. Souls are going to get saved. God is going to do miracles. Why? Because it's not just a victory outreach thing. It's a South African thing where there is revival that is taking place. And we're grateful that we're able to be a part of what God wants to do in these last days. Victory outreach is a part of this great revival. And it's exciting to be able to be a part of it. Go ahead and give the Lord one more good round of applause. Come on, you in the back. Hallelujah. Put Jesus a round of applause. Glory to God. It was a little warm when I walked in, but I think it's cooled down a little bit. If, yeah. Wave at me if you feel okay. Okay, good. Yeah, look at that. Look at the response. Hallelujah. I get nervous for you, buddy. You feel far. Hey! Hallelujah. You okay? It's all right. All this is all right. Hallelujah. It's lick on my lick on my blue. Hallelujah. I know it's liquor here in the front, but is it liquor in the back? Because they say local is liquor. Hallelujah. Come on, son. Praise the Lord. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to get into this this morning. I'm in my second part of the series that I started last week. And last week we had load shedding, so I wasn't able to preach the first part to you. So you can go to our YouTube channel. Go to our YouTube channel, and hopefully it will be uploaded by then. And you can go ahead and check out last week's message that had to do with the same theme that I'll be talking about here this morning. And the title of the message this morning, this is part two, somebody say part two, is the condition of the soil determines the result of the seed. The condition of the soil determines the result of the seed. And so here in this portion of scripture, Jesus is using a parable in communicating God's patience and God's long suffering with the people of Israel. He's actually telling them 
that for three years Jesus has been doing his earthly ministry, been performing signs and wonders and going from town to town doing good and doing ministry. But for some reason, the people of Israel were not yet responding. And so there was not the fruit that God the Father wanted to see. So he uses this parable to communicate to Israel that for three years I've been coming back looking for fruit and I keep finding the tree empty. The tree is empty. So then God says, cut it down. Sure. Hey, it's not a, what does it say? It's not a nice thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. I know God's gracious and merciful, but he's also just. So some of you that are uh, got doing the hokey pokey with the Lord, you got one foot out, you put one foot in, you take a one foot out, you do the hokey pokey and you shake yourself around, and that's what it's all about. Right? We see you in January, you're gone in February, then you're back in March, and then you come back in April, and then you're gone for June, July, and August. Come on, somebody. And then you come back, right? You know, and you got one foot in, you're taking one foot out. Then you come back in, you do the hokey pokey, and you turn this up. Be careful when you play with the grace of God. Somebody say, don't play with the grace of God. Hallelujah. And so for three years, the, the, the owner of the vineyard came and looked for fruit and didn't find no fruit. So he came to the point where he said, cut it down. But then the one working with the tree, how we thank God that we have someone working with us. Yeah. He says, no, don't cut it down. Let me give it some special attention. Yeah. Let me do what I got to do with this tree. And if you let me work with this tree for a year and it still has no fruit, then you can do what you got to do. But I'm believing that after I work with this tree for, for a year, that it's going to bring the fruit that you desire. And how many believe that God is going to work with us this year to bring the fruit that he desires? How many want to see new levels in their walk with Jesus? See, this parable, although it was initially addressed to Israel, can also be carried over to you and I. That God's desire, the same way that he had a desire for Israel to be fruitful, he also has a desire for you and I to be fruitful in our walk with Jesus. In other words, we should not be in state, we should not stay the same. Come just as you are, but not stay just as you are. There should be change, there should be victory, there should be progress that takes place within a Christian's life as they're on the journey with the Lord. See, God is patient as he watches us in our Christian journey. That our, but at some point, he wants to see uh, uh, fruit and fulfillment come to pass. He wants to see fruit and fulfillment come to pass. And we learned last week that it's not the seed that sometimes is the challenge. It's not the word that's been spoken into our lives. It's not even the promises that God has given to us that determine the result. There's nothing wrong with the seed. It's always the condition of the soil. So the man says, hey, don't cut it down. Let me work with it. But what does he say when he says, let me work with it? He says, I'll dig around it, and then I'll fertilize it. In other words, I'll work with the outside of it. I'll work with everything that's going on there. I'll work with the soil, but I don't have to remove the seed. He doesn't say I'm going to put new seed. He says, there's nothing wrong with the seed. But in order for this seed to give the fruit that you want to see, then I got to work with the soil. And I got good news for us this morning. There's nothing wrong with God's word, and there's nothing wrong with God's promises. If God has spoken his word to us, and God has given us promises for our future, if we're not seeing those things come to pass, there's nothing wrong with the seed. We should take a good look at the condition of our soil. Somebody say, check me out. Check, search my heart, David said. Search my heart, O oh God, for you desire truth in the inner man. Search me and allow my heart to be where it needs to be, to be able to give you the fruit that you desire. How many want to bring glory to Jesus in 2020? <laughs> Only 10 of you. I said, how many want to bring glory to Jesus? How many know that he paid a price for our sin? How many know that he sacrificed his life? So that you and I can not only be saved, but can be fruitful in our walk with Jesus Christ. 
Last week we learned what are ways to go ahead and detect the conditions of our soil. We learned last week that the way to detect the condition of our soil, if our soil is working against us, then the first thing that we need to look up is the words that come out of our mouth. If our words are always complaining and always negative and always there's something wrong with the soil. Whatever comes out of our mouth, if we're always gossiping, I should have preached that message to you guys. Dude. You probably said you need to hear that. Hallelujah. We're always going for an opportunity to talk about people. I need to hear about this. If that's constant, the conversation, if that's constant, what's being spoken about, then there is something wrong with the soil. There should eventually be, man, God has been faithful. Uh, at the end of the year, I was believing God for this, and he opened up a door, and he, he gave me a brand new job, or I was believing God for my son or my daughter to get saved. And this year, I'm believing God for them to get saved. I've stepped out by faith, and I'm involved in the ministry. I've been seeing the miracle working power of God in January. There should be a praise that comes from our mouth. We should begin to walk away from the negativity that has held us back year after year and begin to step in. There is something wrong with the soil. I preached the message in Colorado. I told some of you got to put away your violin. Do you like to sing that sad song? Nobody knows. You know what's coming. Hallelujah. The trouble I see, right? They didn't know it was coming. They liked it. Hell yeah, they liked it. Hell yeah. They've been doing that for years. Hallelujah. You got to put that violin away. And you need to pick up that harp. Oh. See, David didn't play a violin in the cave. David didn't play a violin when Saul was throwing spears at him. David picked up a harp. Come on, somebody. And he praised God anyway. Some of you got to learn to praise God anyway. You got to put that violin away. The violin of 2019. The violin of 2018. The violin of, oh, no, you don't know what I've been through. The violin of, oh, my God. And you need to begin to pick up that harp of praise. And you begin to say, God has given me a new song. God has given me a new praise. God, is there anybody here that has a new song in their heart? Because God has broken the yoke of bondage within your life. And God has restored you. There should be new words that begin to come out of our mouth. That show the condition of our soil. Not only the words of our mouth, but the works of our hands. At some point we should be activated in the things of God. You gotta go to YouTube and listen to the whole thing. The depth of our worship was the third thing that shows the condition of our soil. And this morning, as you detect the condition of your soil, or you recognize, man, and I think all of us, I said it in the first service and I'll say it again, that all of us, no matter if we've been serving God for 50 years, we all have room to grow and to get better for Jesus. There is none of us that have arrived. There is none of us that are better than the next man. We should not be comparing ourselves with each other, but we should be comparing ourselves to the word, comparing ourselves with ourselves. Am I better this year than I was last year? Am I improving in my walk and my journey with the Lord? How many want to get better for Jesus in 2020? And as you begin to look and think about the things that are holding us back, I want to give you a few things that the, that the man that's working with the tree promises he will do to be able to get the fruit from that tree that the owner desired. See, God the Father is the owner of the vineyard. Jesus is the one di directly working with the tree. And you and I represent the tree and all of them. God the Father, Jesus, and us yes. want to see fruit come forth from our lives. But we must understand that desire alone is not enough. Because many people desire, hallelujah. They say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. This year is my year. Well, I thought last year was your year. <laughs> no, no, no. Last year, I, you know, I just kind of, you know, I got a little you know, distracted. Well, you got distracted the year before that. And then what about the year before? Brother, well, you've been getting distracted for the last 10 years. <laughs> Ooh, you don't like that, I, 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 I
begin to 
push deeper inside of us his word and his will for our life. See, the reason that Jesus begins to speak about digging around, it's, it also could be in comparison to the parable that he speaks in Matthew 13. Matthew 13, he also talks about seed and soil. And there in Matthew 13, he talks about the conditions of the soil, three conditions. One of them was a hardened soil. A hardened soil where the seed just laid on the outside. Then there was a shallow soil that looked good for a minute. That looked good. I can my hand. And it looked good. I mean, wow. Then you give them the mic and the round and they testify. Oh, look at this guy's on fire. And then you see him. But well, all of a sudden. <laughs> what happened to where did they what happened to her this that because the Bible says because the son or the child because there was no depth in who they are or who they were in walking with God it talks about a shallow soil and then the third one talks about a thorny soil somebody say thorny the thorny soil the, 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 the thorny thorny soil I've been on a lot of planes, my God. You know, to get to Europe, I was 55 hours on a plane. 55! Sure. I, was, I was ready. I was this close to just jumping in the aisle. So I put the chair back as soon as the lights went out. I was going to roll in the aisle. Come on, somebody. I was going to lay right in the aisle until they kicked me up. Come on, I was all tired. Hallelujah. So the, the, the thorny soil. The thorny soil is a soil that has fruit for a little while, but then eventually begins to be choked. And the choking comes from the worries of life or the love of money. Yeah. The love of money. The Bible says in the last day there will be perilous times. People will be lovers of themselves and lovers of money. Be careful as we live in the last days that you don't fall so in love with money that you get distracted from the things of God. Seed begins to choke. Hallelujah. To the, the, the thorny. To the, the, the thorny. Hallelujah. And in Matthew 13, verse 18 through, you can read it. Jesus talks about the, the answer. He breaks it down to the disciples and he shares with them the exact same things that I shared with you just right now. See, these conditions that we talk about when it comes to the soil can, can be caused, they can become hardened because of life's disappointments. You get disappointed in life, or you get disappointed with ministry, or you get disappointed with this, and all of a sudden our heart is not responding anymore. We're standing here, we're here, but the heart has become hardened, and when the heart becomes hardened, the, the seed is preached, the word is preached, the promises go out, but the heart is hardened, and the, and the seed hits the soil, but then the Bible says that the, the birds of the air come and take it. The birds of the air, because that person did not, did not have an understanding of the word. And how many know that's important? That's why life flow is so important. That's why we come back on Sunday nights. That's why we get plugged into life groups on Tuesdays. That's why we want to get involved in the gang. That's why we want to get relationship in the church. Because just sitting here on Sunday is not enough. See, these conditions, my friend, if our heart has become hardened, or our, our, our heart is shallow and has no root, or we're constantly distracted by worry or money, then we will not be able to see the fruit or the fulfillment that God wants to see within our lives. What are some things that you and I can do during the digging process? Number one, I believe it's important to stay repentive. That if a person is repentive in their walk with God and in their journey, then that we practice repentance. How many know repentance is important? Coming before the Lord and asking for forgiveness. God, forgive me. Forgive me. I think on a daily basis, you and I should be able to come before the Lord and begin to repent and turn from the things that we've done. A stubbornness, a pride, a, a way we talked about this one or that one. And there's a repenting. There's a turning of the way. And all of a sudden, there's a softening of the heart. But when a person is not repenting, their heart becomes religious and hardened. And all of a sudden, there's an inability 
to respond to God's word. See, repent, staying prayerful and repentful before the Lord keeps our hearts soft and able to respond to God and his word. The Bible says God will not despise a broken and contrite heart. When's the last time we came before the Lord and repented? When's the last time you shed tears before the Lord? Now, I don't believe that you've got to cry all the time. I do. Hallelujah. I love to cry. Like, woo. I love to be broken before the Lord. I love when I feel that warm. I don't care who's looking. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah, God. You've been so good to me. I should not be here right now. I should not be the one that I should not have the wife that I have. I, I should not have the things that I have. But you have been so good. You've looked past my failures. You've looked past my shortcomings. And you have been good to me. I come before the Lord broken and repentant. God, forgive me for displeasing you. Forgive me for disrespecting you. And then not only asking for forgiveness, but also forgiving. I forgive her. I forgive him. I, I let it go. I'm not going to allow my heart to become bitter from some situation or circumstance and let the bitterness rob me of the future that you have for my life. So therefore, I forgive. Yeah. How many want to release forgiveness to step into the future? Go ahead and clap a little bit if that's you. A repentant brokenness before the Lord. Secondly, there should be a constant stirring or hunger for personal growth. Not satisfied with where we are at. Yes. And the desiring for the next level in our walk with God. Remember that comfort and growth cannot live together. Comfort and growth can never coexist. You can't have comfort and growth. Comfort wants to watch Netflix. Comfort wants to just chill. And have some pizza. And just hang out. On Tuesday night, oh, I'm not going to go to life group because I'm going to watch this uh, Korean show. Come on, somebody. She loves Korean show. I, I, I say, I don't know. I get tired of reading the subtitle. I don't get it. How are you going to watch this thing? you got to read the whole time. Well, grab a book and read. Hallelujah. You want to read? Read. My God. But some of us will sit in front of these stories and watch these people's story. But what about your story? Now, what about the story that you're writing with your life? Get out of that rut. Get out of that rut. We don't come in Sunday nights anymore. Because you got bad habits. You got bad habits. You don't even think about it anymore. You already got your, your habit is Sunday morning. Go get lunch and that's it. You don't even you don't even think about stretching anymore. But you want to see fruit. You want to see promises. You want to see all these things. Well, we're going to have to do our part. We're going to have to stretch a little bit if we want to see the realities of the promises come to pass. If you're willing to stretch a little bit, go ahead and clap this morning here in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Another one is the guarding of our eyes and our ears. See, we've got to be careful what we let our little eyes watch and our little ears listen to. Because what comes in will cultivate the condition. If we're watching these movies, some of you get online, you're watching all these things, especially this day's time, you kids, the young people, my God, everything's so easy. You just go on your phone and come on, you know the go-to. You don't even need to be looking at the phone to go to the go-to, you don't do. <laughs> but you don't know that what you're, you're spending time watching and looking at is getting inside of you and messing with the condition of the inside of your life. And there you are, frustrated and discouraged in your walk with God. Be careful what you let your eyes entertain. The movies we watch, the online, some of us spend more time on social media. They say social media is the leader to depression. That's why this generation is so depressed. Because they're constantly watching social media and comparing themselves with their life and this life and that. Most of the stuff that's posted is not even true. It's just things in the facade that they're trying to put up. They're trying to portray that they're this person or that person. 
get your face back in his book. You need to get your face back in his word. You need to begin to read his word and study his word and let your life be consumed with the word of God and begin to live for Jesus. Be careful what you allow to be entertained with your eyes and the things that you listen to. Some of us listen to worldly music constantly.
I keep it real, hallelujah. But at some point, I, I've been bleeding, I've been bitter. One month goes by, I'm still bitter, I'm still bleeding. Two months goes by, I'm still bitter. Two years go by, I'm still bitter. And all of life is passing me by. All of life is going forward without me. And here I am, still sinking, still singing that sad song. Why? Because the people that I surrounded myself with were all stuck in the same place. While the whole world around us is going forward, I need to start connecting with somebody that is going forward so that they can begin to speak life into me. And I'm sure they're going to say, I went through that also. I went through that season too. And this is what God did for me. And all of a sudden, I'm hearing a different voice. I'm having a different conversation. And I need this conversation filled a little bit better, filled a of the soil. It was the condition of the soil. And then after he dug around it, loosened it up, took out some of the things that were working against it, took out some of that hiding stuff, began to remove that. I believe there's a new freedom when that happens. And some of the songs we were singing this one man, I felt free in this house. I felt a freedom. I see the worship team moving up past it. Almost jumped up here with them. Yeah. Hallelujah. There's a freedom in the house of God. There's a freedom in the presence of God. And when those things, that hardened heart becomes soft again, that hardened heart begins to be moist again, starts to receive, starts to believe again, starts to have hope. Hope, the Bible says, will not disappoint you. When you protect your hope in the futures of God, then he says, after I've dug around it, then I'm going to fertilize it. The fertilizer had to do, and I'm going to close with this, is the fertilizer being put into the soil didn't come from the soil. It was an outside source that the one that was working with the tree, he says this soil can only do so much for itself. I need to bring outside help. I need to bring an outside help into this soil fertilizer that will be able to empower this seed, to be able to breathe life on this seed. And how many know Jesus? He promised us that he wouldn't leave us as orphans. He wouldn't leave us by ourselves. He places a calling upon our life, but then he says, I'm also going to give you the power to do it. I've given you a calling. I've placed a calling upon your life to pr pr produce fruit. The Bible says fruit that will last. And I know my calling sometimes feels intimidating. I know my calling sometimes can make you look at the inadequacies of who you are as a person and begin to look down on yourself. But I got good news for you. Although I've been the one that placed the calling upon your life, I'm not expecting you to get there by yourself. I'm going to bring another. He says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send another. He said, it's better for me to go because when I go, I'm going to send another. His name is going to be counselor. His name is going to be advocate. His name is going to be the one that is with you. He will be with you. And not only will he be with you, but he will also be inside of you. And that one that's inside of you, the world cannot recognize him. The world cannot see it. But when they watch your life, they're going to know that there's something different about you. Why? Because there's something supernatural that has been released in your life. God wants to fertilize us this morning. He wants to release. 
release the power of his Holy Spirit. The power of his Holy Spirit to be able to empower us to live the life that God has called us to live. Remember the disciples, they all walked away at the cross. But then when the book of Acts, the Spirit came upon them. Their desires were there at the cross. But their desires could not bring fulfillment to their lives. So they walked away. But then the Lord came back and says, wait in Jerusalem. I know you walked away. I know you failed. I know you've fallen short. I know you messed up. But I just want you to know, the life that I'm calling you to, you can't get there on your own. So get to that upper room. Wait in that upper room. And there in that upper room, not only am I going to dig around me, but I'm going to pour out a fertilizer. I'm going to pour out the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to empower you to live the life that I have called you to live. The power of the Holy Ghost. Lift up your hands. He's here this morning. He's here this morning. He's here this morning. Worship him a little bit. The Holy Spirit is here this morning. Yeah. That's it, worship him. Worship him a little bit. Begin to come. Begin to come. Begin to come. 